All right, we're ready to go. Welcome, everybody. Um, for many of you, it's the morning. For some of you, it's super late at night. So I'm so glad that you are here with us um, right now. And so this is uh, the food panel. We've just been calling it the food panel. It has a proper name. It's it's up there somewhere. It's the morning. You can figure it out. Um, my name is Kay Tempest Bradford. I am the vice chair of the Carl Brandon Society steering committee and uh, the host of today's panel. But today's panel is not about me. It is going to be about our fabulous panelists who I'm going to have introduce themselves in a little bit. Uh, but just a tiny preamble for those of you um, who this is your first panel with us. The Carl Brandon Society is a nonprofit organization which is, was formed basically to help promote um, the inclusion of people of color by POC, BAME folks, um, everybody who falls under those various uh, umbrellas uh, in science fiction, fantasy, horror, and other speculative fiction. And so that is actually what this panel and the other panels that we have been doing throughout the summer have been all about, which is um, promoting and supporting uh, people of color and and giving them opportunities to do panels where they get to talk about stuff that they want to talk about that they don't always get to talk about at cons um, because they're shoved off onto other panels that are less exciting. So we're just gonna do it ourselves because we're living in a time where we can just do virtual panels and lovely people like yourselves will show up or we'll watch later. All right, so with today's panel on food and colonization, I'm expecting an awesome conversation. And uh, this conversation is going to be, I'll, I'm the moderator, but you're not going to hear from me much because we're going to, it's going to be mostly these awesome panelists who I, I love them all. And I'm so glad that they're all here. So I'm going to have them introduce themselves and we're going to start uh, with Aliette. First, I'm going to unmute myself and then I'm going to introduce myself. It's my first Zoom panel of the day, you know how it goes. Um, my name is Aliette Bedard. I'm a writer of fantasy and science fiction. I'm a Nebula Award and British Science Fiction Association Award winner, among other things. Uh, I write stories about tea, spaceships, dragons, not necessarily in that order. And my latest book is Seven of Infinities, which is Vietnamese inspired space opera in which a lot of the action takes place in tea houses and involves dumplings and various kinds of noodle soups, which are the best bits of the book. Now I need to read that book and also eat all that food. Jamie. Hey, I'm Jamie Go, reaching y'all from um, 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. Malaysia time. Uh, I am a science fiction fantasy writer and an editor with Tachyon Publications. My fiction tends to um, kind of like run the gamut of like weird stuff uh, and, uh, and recipes. I'm, I'm very interested in cooking. Um, my dad was a food technologist with Nestle and then with Givadon, um, which I then found out that apparently had um, uh, donated like this multi-million endowment to UC Riverside for citrus research. And I did my PhD in comparative literature um, at UC Riverside where I focused on um, uh, critical race theory and science fiction studies, which is the general umbrella and my specific dissertation project was on whiteness in steampunk. Um, so that is my stuff in a nutshell. Awesome, thank you. Nibs? Hi all, I'm Nibedita. <clears throat> I am also a science fiction fantasy writer, mostly fantasy, mostly dark fantasy and horror. Surprisingly, coincidentally, um, most of my stuff tends to deal with themes of food and hunger and colonialism as cannibalism, because why not? Shock horror. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am from India. I am a queer cis woman uh, and an immigrant to the USA. Uh, back in India, I'm more specifically, I'm Bengali. I'm from West Bengal and Calcutta. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at H E R her underscore Nibsen, N I B S E N. Um, Michi? Hi, I'm Michi Troda. Uh, I am a writer, editor, fire spinner based in Chicago. It is 9 a.m., and I haven't had my coffee yet. 
So <laughs> I'm gonna be a little rambly today. Um, I'm currently the editor in chief for Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, and also the senior editor for PRISM, which is a uh, Bi uh, BIPOC-led news and media site. Uh, I write primarily uh, nonfiction, critical and personal essay, um, and I focus a lot on using pop culture as a lens to look at current issues and understand uh, historical events and also about looking at connective threads, particularly for those of us who are in the diaspora who are trying to understand identity and uh, found that fandom science fiction fantasy has actually been one of the best ways for me to understand how critical race theory works um, and how to integrate that into much more personal writing. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, talking about food. This is my passion, my biggest thing about stories when I read them is what kind, how is the food presented because if it's not done with thought and care about how food is actually a really large part of how we relate to each other and how we talk to each other, it throws me right out of the story. So I'm super excited to be able to have this conversation with everybody here whose works I've really loved reading and all of whom have something to do with food and their stuff that has really made me happy. Thank you. Anya? Hi everyone, I'm Anya. Currently it's 1 a.m. in Melbourne, so I might be a little bit wired on sugar. Um, I'm a science fiction and fantasy author. Uh, my latest novel novella is Cradle and Grave. It's a post-apocalyptic book that came out earlier this year. I was also the winner of Avatar's Inc. short story competition this year with a story called Life in Acha. So about very much about recipes, including yeah, acha and onde onde. Uh, food is a large part of my short story writing and hopefully soon more of my novel writing as well. It's one of my main obsessions in life. And I think it very much makes life worth living, especially in these dark days. <laughs> so really excited to be here talking about it. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, just to let everybody know, um, what we're going to do is uh, the panel is going to talk uh, for about 45 minutes or so. And if we have time and, and if we have the ability to keep going, because it's early for some of us and very late for some of us, um, we may have time for audience questions. Um, but if we don't get to audience questions at the end, all of these people are going to tell us where you can find them on social media. You could like maybe sneak over and ask questions and offer like food in exchange. Um, so I, uh, I want to start off by uh, just reading this little bit. This is sort of like the foundation that uh, the folks on this panel uh, put together as like, this is, this is really like the core of what we want to talk about. Um, Asia, with over 60% of the world's population and a longer history of migration, colonization, empire. So the food from the various parts of Asia has changed significantly as people have moved around. TV series like Ugly Delicious and Michael Poland's Cooked and others are bringing ethnically, regionally, culturally diverse foods into the public eye, but still often with a third culture or colonizers lens. So um, my first question is about colonization of food. There are some well-known items in colonized culture like General Tso's chicken or chicken tikka masala. What other foods from your particular cultures are like this and what are the original dishes like? Uh, and I think I want to start with nibs. Honestly, um, that description kind of like already stole the one thing I would have talked about, which is chicken tikka masala, right? Uh, and it's 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 so weird because like I, I honestly don't know what I would pin down as like an original dish that it it transformed from or was inspired by. Maybe butter chicken, maybe chicken rishmi masala. I don't know. But the really interesting thing is. Um, you can now you could chicken tikka masala is now starting to pop up on menus in india as well like it's you can find it on menus in restaurants in in calcutta at least and i just find that so fascinating the way this thing goes just comes full circle well what 
I actually was really fascinated by, and, and several of my friends uh, who are Indian or Indian America have told me this, is that um, when people talk about, oh, I want to have curry, I'm going to have a curry, like that is actually like meaningless. Like curry is not a thing in India, but like it, it's a word that has become associated with Indian food. Like what the heck is, what the heck is curry if, if it's not what, what people in the West think it is? Oh, honestly, curry is, I mean, at least in Bengali and Hindi, curry, the word literally just means like gravy, right? It's it's the thick gravy, like slosh sauce, that not slosh sauce, God, that comes with like a chicken or vegetable. So you, you could have vegetable curries. You could have, uh, the word we use for them in Bengali is tarkari. It's a vegetable dish, it's called tarkari, it's a side dish. But yeah, it's just uh, meat, usually some kind of base of either onions or tomatoes, um, various spices, uh, cooked in various ways. And uh, the, the flavor profile and the ingredients change dramatically depending on which part of the world, which part of the India you're, you're, you're talking about. And uh, yeah, the chicken chetnut curry is very different from like a Bengali kosher mangsho, which is like goat meat. That's so fucking good. Uh, yeah, curry does not have a, does not have a pan-Indian universal meaning at all. Why am I not just now I want to jump in for a second here, like in Malaysia, where we do have a lot of like South Asian um, migrants over the uh, over the generations. Like when we say curry, we do mean we do also mean like a gravy that usually has some level of chili spiciness to it. Um, but it's often kind of like this catch all term to describe what Westerners might call a stew. Um, with its with a very particular blend of of spices and seasonings, um, and we, they they come in all different kinds of flavors and 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 colors, which is pretty fun. Like yellow versus red versus green curries, Thai green curry, for example, um, which then you know because it's such uh, a versatile kind of dish, gets adapted to various things. KFC here for a very memorable period, had green curry um, chicken, like curry chicken, like green curry, they were serving green How curry. How did that go? Uh, I think it went well, but it didn't, it didn't become permanent. Like our permanent things are original recipe and hot and spicy. And for a time there was a Tom Yum, um, there was this Tom Yum flavored uh, KFC as well, which I think lasted a little longer than, than green curry um, KFC stuff. Fast food it's a, it's, kind of wild in Southeast Asia, like the Ramli burgers, and I think there was congee briefly in Singapore. <laughs> the KFC yeah, we don't food. call it congee, do we? We call it yeah, we call it porridge. Yeah, we call it porridge. So yeah. when I first went to this, to I think it was in England, and I went into like some diner, and I was like, "Oh, they have porridge here!" And I get this, <laughs> oh, no, no. and I was so disappointed. I was just like, "What yeah. is this nonsense? What yeah, is this? It sweet? And it was what like, is this sweet. texture? This is disgusting. Take it away from me!" <laughs> I, I was really shocked. And they have this thing called rice pudding, which I first saw in Australia, and it was like sweet for no. We have that, interestingly, we have this thing called paish in India, which is, it, I mean, it gets translated as rice pudding because, like, there's really no other way to translate it, but it's absolutely not what you would call pudding in the West. It's, it's much more fluid, liquid in texture, not set. Mm. Uh, and speaking of which, it's really interesting that Jamie brought the, uh, the, the, the issue of curry being like uh, equated with stew. Cause like, it's, it's absolutely not. The texture of the gravy that comes with curry is yeah. much more uh, viscous, more uh, clumpier for lack of a better word. Cause it's meant to be eaten with rice is the thing, right? Yes. It's, it's meant to be and eaten in over fact, rice. Like when I grew, when I went, when I got to Canada and I started eating stew there, I was just like, why is your stew so week Why is because so like watery? the way we cook stew in malaysia is that we cook it like we cook curry like yeah it's meant it to be and like, got, like, yeah yeah exactly yes. you can mix the rice in there yeah because yeah. If it, you can't mix rice and like you can't mash up your potatoes with, with you know with all the meat in it then what, what's what is your life what does your life mean <laughs> yeah for me there's the love for me this what people call stew is like broth right that's something you put noodles in right so whereas vietnam has something called curry which is probably derived from curry and is like not a stew. It's also meant to be eaten with rice. And it's like various kind of root vegetables um, with a variable spice mix. And then, 
generally chicken, but can be shrimp or whatever meat you happen to have. Um, and it's probably a Khmer dish in origin, like culinary history gets so complicated. But to come back to the original question, one thing I wanted to bring up is like, what colonizer culture are we talking about though? Because I feel like we've been using that shorthand for Western and especially US um, or at least the modern West. But like, if we're talking about the history of Vietnam, we have a thousand years of Chinese colonization to start with, uh, then French and then US. So, you can see that sort of reflected in the food culture, right? You have different dishes that come from different sources. So we have haunt fans, which are wontons, um, and are very clearly, you know, derived from a classic Chinese dumpling, except that we put fish sauce in them. Uh, and then you have dishes like boho, which are, um, so it's a beef, actually I would use stew for that one. It's actually a beef stew. And I've never been able to obtain an actual official academic proper answer to where does this come from. But if you look at the list of ingredients, which has carrots and potatoes and beef, which is a fairly unusual ingredient actually in Vietnamese food, it looks like hell. Like somebody tried to make a Vietnamese version of boeuf bourguignon, which is a French classic of like beef stew and added extra spices and like star anise and pepper and ginger and a bunch of things that the French would definitely not put, you know, Boeuf Bourguignon has wine in it. Um, and, and tried to make that dish stand out, right? Um, and then I think, you know, it, it, even if we're talking colonized and how this food evolved, the other thing is obviously what um, diaspora and how diaspora in turn affects what kind of foods we're talking about, right? Because uh, there are subcultures of food. Um, the Vietnamese American food is very different from the Vietnamese French food, which in turn is very different from, you know, the various, well, what I would call Vietnamese cuisine. And obviously all of that encompasses like smaller, you know, there's central Vietnamese French food and et cetera uh, by region. But you, it's kind of all those things that are kind of cousins to each other and are very similar, but not quite the same. In France, a very popular dish lately has been bogun, which is uh, slices of beef, rice vermicelli, and the kind of um, fish sauce dressing. Uh, it, it's a yeah, diaspora dish. Like it does not exist or it's not that big at any rate in Vietnam, right? It's a thing that was made um, when the first Vietnamese immigrants came over, well, the first big wave of Vietnamese immigrants came over in the war, in the wake of the Vietnamese American war in the 60s, 70s. Um, and it's not inauthentic, right? You know, um, we, t we, I mean, authentic is such a loaded word. I'm gonna try to avoid that, but um, you know, my grandmother makes that at home uh, when I visit her, but um, it's just fascinating that when I go to Vietnam, everybody's like, what, what is this? Yeah, no, that's like a regular salad, right? There's nothing special about it, but it's not like over here, we have restaurants that are specialized in it. And then they microwave the soybeans, like don't get me started on like the horrors that they do. But, <laughs> but it's really, to me, it's really been fascinating to see how the cuisine adapts because you don't have the ingredients, because, um, you know, regional differences, regional preferences, where your diaspora is from. The Vietnamese diaspora in France is overwhelmingly made up of Vietnamese from the South, and that in terms affects the kind of dishes that you will find. Uh, trying to appeal, whether you're trying to appeal to local taste or not, and to some extent you always are trying to appeal to the dominant culture. So you get a different. If I go to Chinatown, where uh, the Vietnamese food is, for again complicated reasons, um, the the food that I'm going to get served is different if I, than if I walk into a random rest, Vietnamese restaurant in Paris because they're catering to a whole different crowd of people. Yeah, and actually, I, I want to follow up on one of the things you talked about in there, Aliette. But first, I want to uh, get Michi in here to answer the question. Yeah, I mean, I, I really appreciate what Elliot was saying about being specific about what colonizing experience, uh, colonizing influences we're talking about. Um, I know with the Philippines, um, we're at, uh, the Philippines has been influenced by multiple uh, waves of tra you know, trade, colonization, occupation, 
Um, and a lot of what I grew up knowing of, knowing of Filipino food, the interesting thing that I found that it looks like is that Filipino food hasn't necessarily been changed nearly as much by Filipinos who have come to America and creating the food here and having to do what Elliot uh, mentioned, which is finding ingredients that were available on hand to adapt to the dishes that you know you were familiar with bringing over from you know from the previous country. But the, with a lot of Filipino food, you didn't really have, particularly for talking about American influences on Filipino food, it didn't have to wait for it to be brought over here to be influenced. It was already changed and influenced by the fact that there was, the US was occupying the Philippine Islands before World War II. Um, there were the naval, you know, the naval and army bases that were all over the Philippines. And that meant that foods like hot dogs and Spam and Velveeta cheese, all of these things became part of the cuisine there because they're shelf stable, because they might've been cheaper, more easily ac accessible than traditional foods, which were being uh, you know, the sources were, were harder to come by because of a lot of different reasons. But some of the things that I know most, that I identify most deeply as Filipino food are things that were already influenced by the Americans. Uh, Filipino spaghetti with hot dogs and banana ketchup, uh, spam silog, which is just basically silog is the breakfast dish of garlic fried, you know, garlic fried rice and a fried egg and some kind of meat. You know, bungus is like a, a fried fish or longanisa or tocino, but spam just naturally was a thing that they threw on top of that because it makes total sense. And now spam is really a thing that is all, not just in the Philippines, but pretty much anywhere that the Americans had bases in, throughout Asia and the Pacific. Spam is like a huge thing. Same thing with hot dogs. Um, but then, you know, you look at what if we're talking about influences from, say, China, which also at periods had colonized uh, parts of the Philippines, um, one of my favorite foods is absolutely traceable back to China. It's lumpia. So it's, it's an adaptation of a fried Chinese egg roll. It's lumpia is slightly different in that you're looking for something that's more of a cigar shape and size. It's rolled. It's not necessarily folded on the ends. Um, you use very, very thin crispy wrapper as opposed to a little bit more of that hearty egg roll wrapper. Um, but it's really fascinating when we actually look at how colonization, but also cross pollination is a thing that happens. And when Filipinos come to the US, looking at all the different ways that you can adapt the food that you remember, or now that you can access, because we are at a point in time where shipping technology now means that it's easier to get things over here, the you know, storage and refrigeration, um, and just the fact that there is now, for better or for worse, because white people have discovered our food, um, it means that there's more access, there, the benefit for us is that there's more access. We can actually find these things a little bit easier, depending on whether or not we wanna pay the upscale price for finding you know, um, ube extract in Whole Foods, which absolutely not, but, and I was just at a, I will share this off because I was at a, I found a new pastry place that opened up in, um, in Chicago. It's Filipino owned. So they all, but the pastry chef is French trained. So we ended up with a thick thing like this, which is a Basque cake, um, which normally is filled with some kind of cream or jam on the inside. But this, it has ube and huckleberry jam on the inside, which it's one of those things where you're like, this is absolutely the right, you know, the right kind of uh, blending of flavors and, you know, taking something that is from Filipino culture and adapting it to a different type of cooking. And I love that we see this and that it's actually coming from another Filipino chef. And I think that's something that I know all of us wanted to talk about is, you know, Elliot talks about the idea of authenticity and what we're trying to, we're trying to avoid that landmine of making diet of labeling things that are done particularly by diaspora folks who are adapting to a different culture different environment different ingredients and making their own thing and somehow they're suddenly blasted for being inauthentic whereas you'll have white chefs who are like "Ooh, i've suddenly discovered this thing and i'm going to make it in the traditional authentic way and suddenly getting kudos for things that you know your mom has been making in your kitchen 
since you were a child and you were getting made fun of for bringing it to school. Yeah, and that's actually exactly what I wanted to touch on because um, especially with one of the examples given, you know, it, it, General Tso's chicken, you, you know, there, there are people like, oh, that's inauthentic. It's American Chinese food. But the, the foods that we, that Americans consider to be Chinese food, you know, the dishes that we're used to um, and, and even dishes from, you know, other places were dishes that were developed by people who came from whatever culture, right? And they were developed because as you all were talking about, um, you know, the ingredients changed. They couldn't get some ingredients, they could get others. And then they also had to change for the palates of where they were because this food was was for their community, but it was also for like the wider community um, or more mainstream eating. And so it's not as if like those dishes are inauthentic they may not be exactly the same as what came from you know the the origin country but it doesn't make them any less like you know created by people from that country so what are the foods that um have been changed by the process either of colonization or just migration um that are you know perhaps considered to be quote inauthentic but that you love because they're the foods that you're used to growing up with for whatever reason or they're just like a really good adaptation of of the of the dish um cream I, cheese uh, wontons. what <laughs> cream cheese wontons i only <laughs> discovered this in adulthood when i moved to like i don't even remember i was probably when i moved to the states maybe it was in canada and i was just like you put one, you put cream cheese in wonton and then you call them crab rangoons. What the hell's a rangoon? Isn't that like a city somewhere in somewhere? And I was just like, what is this? And I ate it, it's like, this is just fucking delicious. Like I would never have thought of putting cream cheese in wonton skin and deep frying that shit. It's awesome. And like, I hate this whole conversation about, oh, this is not right. This is inauthentic. Blah. And this is like, no, it's not, it's not authentic because innovation does not run on authenticity. Innovation requires you to think beyond the old recipes to make things new and novel. Because like, if you don't do that, then like your food becomes boring and stagnant and you lose business, you little capitalist. Um, but also your food just gets really boring, right? And so it's just like, I just like the whole concept of authenticity is kind of like, I kind of, I kind of understood it when I first moved to the West and I was just like, just craving foods from home. But over time, I realized that foods from home were very different from like foods from like other parts of my ancestry. So I'm just like, you know, realizing, for example, like, Yi Sang, which is a thing that we eat um, during Chinese New Year. I know you might know Yi Sang because it's specific to Southeast Asia. It's like this, it's a mess of like some shredded vegetables and like ice crisps and like raw fish. And in Australia, yeah. they put salmon, which is yeah. Good. <laughs> but yeah, we, 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 we started them. doing it with salmon in Malaysia too. Mm -hmm. um, and like the idea being like they, they are first separated in all these like very colorful things and you're supposed to toss them together right you're supposed to toss that and the higher you toss it the more prosperous your lunar year, new year will be i used to annoy um, my parents by just eating the crackers yeah my parents are still annoyed by me just eating the rest of vegetables too. and noodles yeah and it's just like why don't why don't you Rocky. eat it you should put you're supposed to eat all of it together and that's mm -hmm. how you get the prosperity but and I like, like no one in China has ever heard of Yisang. And in fact, apparently in the last 10 years or so, Yisang has started being picked up in various parts of China, but it is essentially a, a Malaysian Chinese invention. It was created in like Ipoh or something, like some one of the out Northern states. Um, and then it, it's been slowly exported to like other parts of the Chinese diaspora. So like this whole question about authenticity and, and things like that, like I'm, I just, I like the word innovation and we should use that. I feel, I feel like there's, you know, that, I, some of the tension emotion. inherent to diaspora is, you know, um, the awareness of where we came from. And I feel this particularly keenly, I should say, because I'm second generation and I'm the second generation of a diaspora that did, migrated because of war, right? So it, it is particularly a diaspora that does 
not really feel like there was any kind of choice because it was a matter of sheer survival. And it was also, you know, in the wake of um, what well, the, the country has changed tremendously. And the reason why the country has changed tremendously is because it was bombed. Uh, and so there is, especially in the generation of my parents, this desire, this dream, this longing to go back to things the way that they were, and especially the way that the food was, right? Uh, and the other strand of that tension is, of course, that time moves forward and cultures move forward. And, you know, as you were saying, Jamie, any culture that does not move forward just ossifies, right? And dies. So the food in particular is an expression of that culture, but not only, is something that keeps changing and that keeps adapting and that keeps taking in influences from the various things that it rubs against. Um, one of my favorite things that I discovered two or three years ago is that there is a Hong Kong pastry chef in the heart of Chinatown who has been making, um, so they're both trained in Hong Kong and in French pastries and they have been making those durian bavaras and mango eclairs and they are just to die for. Um, and so obviously this is not something that my parents would recognize as being part of uh, traditional Vietnamese food, right? But again, we are coming back to the idea of authenticity more being used to police than to actually offer any kind of useful inputs, right? It is something that is mostly used to exclude of like, when you are being unauthentic, right? You are not being faithful. You are not following the tradition. And those are very, you know, laden words and very um, hurtful words, especially, uh, can be very hurtful when we are talking about diaspora. And, you know, it is not, I mean, at least, I know, and I know that I'm not the only one, not finding it easy to work out where it is that you belong in a country where you are not necessarily the majority, uh, but from a country that doesn't really recognize you either, right? That feels familiar, but that mostly also has gone on, as it should, right? Because nothing stands static, but it is sometimes a hard place to be. I think some cultures are also allowed to be more creative with their cuisine than others. Like if you looked at fine dining, uh, Japanese uh, molecular gastronomy, people will be like, oh yeah, we'll pay for that. But if you turned it into like molecular gastronomy Indian, then I think it's a bit harder to accept. Like there was one restaurant just opened in Melbourne before this happened and it was experimental Indian, but I mean, it didn't take off, but if it was experimental Japanese in Australia, it would have been booked out. So, well, the unfairness, but I think as though it's starting to change, at least in Australia, you do start seeing people accept more like creative cooking from different cultures, but not all of them, I think. Yeah, I think like there's there's also that tension on who gets to do the innovation right like when it's what you know there it feels a lot different when you have someone who is not of your culture of your background who understands the meaning uh who, who may not understand the meaning of the food and what it uh how it ties people together and how to navigate respect for tradition and also wanting to innovate. It's different when it's someone who is, has that freedom. Uh, you know, if we're gonna use the US as an example, if you are white in the US and you get to, exp you know, you have been brought up pretty much to look at anybody else's culture as your toy, as your plaything. You can throw it out, you, it's like pouring out a tub of Legos and disregarding the instructions and getting to do whatever you want with it. And then somebody will look at it and be like, oh my God, this is amazing. You are, you are so creative. You take the same kid who is, you know, who is not, you know, who is not white and is playing with their own food traditions and their own memories and understandings of the flavors and textures and also those very intense memories because food is something, one of those things that all of us in a lot, you know, in many different ways will lock into a memory of food and associate it with a feeling, with some kind of sensation and use all of that to really create something different, but you know, they'll be looked at like, oh, but this is your food. It's not really upscale or it's not innovative or it's just, it's just not given the same 
amount of credit or uh, opportunity to be shared and to be looked at as a piece of innovation that other people might like to eat. Um, a favorite example of mine of looking at someone who understood a piece of food and did something really innovative and new with it. There was a group in Chicago that was doing some pop-up, um, you know, obviously pre-coronavirus, but they were doing pop-up uh, meals. And it was a group of uh, multi-ethnic Asian folks from Southeast Asian, East Asian, South Asian, um, who are working together and doing different types of sort of like a riff on takeout. And I went to one where they were doing um, riffs on favorite Asian takeout foods, like Crab Rangoon was definitely in that, was definitely on that menu. And I forgot what they did with it, but it was so amazing that I was sad they only gave me two little, you know, tasting samples on the plate. Uh, but what they did there, they finished off the meal with a dessert and they did a deconstructed halo halo. And if you don't know what halo halo is, it's a Filipino dessert. It's very street, like you will most often see it as a very street food thing. It's layers of jellied fruits with condensed milk and uh, often a uh, pini ping, which you know, toast, uh, toasted sweet rice and um, usually a piece of flan and ube ice cream. It, it literally means mix mix, it's everything. And it's served over shaved ice. So what they did was something where I would expect to see this in a high-end restaurant. They made sugar glass out of red bean. Um, they did uh, a kind of like emulsified cream with, uh, with the coconut water instead of condensed milk. Um, they brulee jackfruit to give you that kind of like candied fruit sort of thing. So all of the textures, all of the flavor layers were appropriately there for Holo Holo, but it looked nothing like Holo Holo. But the second you took a bite of it, it was like, it's like that scene in Ratatouille where the food critic flashes right back to his childhood and eating, you know, the rustic bowl of Ratatouille, but he's eating some, what he's eating on the plate is something artistic and new and beautiful. And I really, really want, what I want is for those of us in the diaspora to have that freedom and to not be pressured into fitting into a very specific idea of what tradition is. And let's be real, the idea of what is acceptable tradition is often imposed on by the colonialist structure of the country that we're in and the majority of, pe uh, and the majority of power. And just have the freedom to be able to experiment and really continue innovating and pushing that cuisine forward. Nib, do you want to add anything? You're muted. I'm going to unmute myself first. Uh, yeah, I was racking my brains for an example of um, Indian food that's been um, Americanized. Or uh, One thing that did come to mind was something that I had trouble like wrapping my head around when I first immigrated here was the idea of curry in jars. Because uh, like, you know, curry to me is something to was to be something you made from scratch and the idea of it coming in a jar was like wait what but wait you honestly, guys don't have ready-made curry in india not really no oh no. you know it, i mean these days if you go to like one of the big air-conditioned westernized rural markets you might find some of the shells but like it at least when i was growing up it was not really a thing that just oh, like that jars so of pre-made curry because like yeah. that was one of the things my dad helped develop um at at nestle what? Yeah, we we were making cur like these packets of like pre like curry mixes to sell to like the larger market because like curry is so labor intensive and it really nobody, is, right? not everybody got time for that. So like exactly. you know, it's, it's useful to just have like a packet to just you know and so like some of my happier memories interning at his lab was like you know making pounding all these curry mixes and oh my putting God, in the processes and like. And like there was one curry capitan like mix which needed like so we would we would prepare I would prepare these um, hundred gram mixes because that's the easiest way it's like oh it's one percent this and one percent that I'll have ninety percent that right and so somehow or another this was a recipe which called for like forty percent chili powder and so I'm like putting it on like you know so you have to boil 
just zero the scale and like you start putting the spices, right? And so I'm pouring on the chili powder and pouring on the chili powder and it keeps getting higher and higher and higher. I'm like, this is very nerve wracking. I'm gonna take this to my boss now. And I show it to my boss and she's like, why is there so much chili powder? I'm like, it says so right here on the recipe. It's called some 40, you know, 40 grams of chili powder. And she's like, huh, well, just mix it up anyway. <laughs> and so mix it up and she tastes it a little bit and she's like, nah, nah, just, just put it aside. And I was like, well, I guess I'll just take it home to my dad. And we had it for dinner. Um, and it was great. <laughs> Amazing. I will tell you that we have like pre-mixed curry spice mixes, pre-mixed spice mixes and like powder mixes are like where right. things we had. Like we have like bachfaro, which is like, uh, bachfaro literally means five spice, but it's not the same thing as five spice in like other yeah. contexts. It's a mix of five, it's a blend of five spices. Uh, and garam masala and stuff, but like uh, the sauce, like actual simmering sauce in jars was not a thing I grew up with. Uh, oh. But it, it, ever since immigrating here, it's a thing I have absolutely come around to. Because like you said, curry, like making curry from scratch, like breaking down those onions and uh, potatoes to make that uh, gravy base, it's so time consuming. And like, it's, it's amazing just have that in a jar and it's just there and ready and you just like, throw your protein in there and it's just done and I love it but like I know my, my mom was like what is this when she visited me when she visited the U.S. for the first time in like 2016 and just yeah I also want to uh, absolutely like second third fourth everything everything that's been said about the idea of authenticity I think I hate that word because like I feel like authenticity is I only ever see it used as a stick to beat marginalized people over the head with and that that just serves no what and Related, I think, um, is the idea of cultural appropriation. And like, it's because uh, the question I obviously ask is what, how do you identify cultural appropriation versus respectful honoring and borrowing, right? Like wh what, how do you know this thing is appropriation? Uh, and there is no good answer, but one, one sort of rule of thumb that I found useful is where is the money flowing, right? Look for, look for who's profiting and be, uh, look at the person who is profiting and do they have the same access to the food that the people from the originating country do? Like, uh, like the reason why people adopting black hairstyles isn't just because, you know, it's you didn't make that, black people did, and you're white. That's not the only reason. The, it, the reason it's fucked up is because black people get shit for having black hairstyles. Right, they, they, they get dinged on professionalism, they lose their jobs, they get forced to cut their hair. Like, they do not have the freedom to equally access the thing that they do, and which you, with your privilege, can take and access with, uh, with impunity, right? So that is that, 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 that paradox, that hypocrisy is like what makes culture appropriation so fucked up. So it's like, are, are the people from this originating culture allowed to equally and freely access their food? Often the answer is no. Like I got shit in grad school for uh, heating up Indian food leftovers in the office, in the, in the shared office space, right? Because people thought it was smelly or weird. So uh, yeah, so a lot of what cultural appropriation for me comes down to is A, where's the money flowing? And B, uh, are you with your privilege being able to access this thing with a degree of uh, impunity that is not afforded to the people who originally came up with it? I have feelings about hipster spam musubi, Nibs. <laughs> I really Can we talk about spam? <laughs> Because like I did not understand spam, I, I didn't understand why people hated spam so much in the West. Because like we don't have like I didn't understand that spam was like just gelatinized meat. Because back here, here we just call it luncheon meat. And one day I went to like some I went to Berkeley Bowl, which is like a very hipster, like like organic food store. And I was like, oh, there's a luncheon meat aisle and it's just like sliced ham and shit and very fancy sliced ham and shit and I was just like I feel very disappointed because to me like luncheon meat is like fucking delicious like spam in a can that you make into slices and stuff. Yeah. There's there I, I I have seen it more and more uh, over the last several years I feel like yeah, the spam wave was following the bacon wave you know the uh, everybody loves bacon wave thing right because just side note bacon spam is fucking delicious it's amazing it crisps yes. slightly better than regular spam it has a smoky 
salty note to it that is not necessary. It's not in the regular spam, but I mean, I'll go to some of these restaurants. I mean, I'm I'm the type of person who will like, oh, new place. I definitely want to go try it, especially if it's you know independent owned and you know Chicago has a really strong food tradition. But there are places that I've been to where I'm like, oh, there's spam musubi on the menu. Why is the spam musubi seven dollars? Seven dollars for spam musubi, and the rice is dry. They've decided to throw something on there like a piece of you know a piece of scrambled egg that is way too thick. The rice isn't seasoned correctly. The spam isn't cooked correctly. Like you have to get that really good sear on the outside so it's crispy. So then the, you know, it balances out the texture of the inside of the spam. When I remember, and it, it makes me so angry because this is the exact same kind of food that I got laughed out of in the, you know, in the lunchroom when I was a kid to the point where like I locked myself in the bathroom stall and cried. And I eventually just stopped eating Spam for years because I kept getting made fun of bringing things like Spam sandwiches or Vienna sausage sandwiches to school because this was like, this was the lunch, yeah, this was the lunch meat that my parents grew up with that they, you know, that they ate in the Philippines. We had Spam, you know, and fried rice practically every Sunday. But all of the things where it's like, well, now as an adult, I'm glad to see Spam more out, you know, more out there, but suddenly everybody being like, oh my God, I love Spam Musubi. I'm like, really? Because I'm pretty sure you were the same jackass who made fun of the Asian kids in the lunchroom for bringing Spam to, bringing spam to school. I'm like, I didn't know also that, realize that in the US at least, Spam gets associated with poverty. So there's the additional uh, issue of, uh, you know, of classism in the US when you're looking at people who are eating Spam. So that makes it doubly shitty that you when you go and you see spam on the menu at some upscale restaurant they're charging you know spam musubi is something you go to hawaii you go to the 7-eleven and it's there next to the hot dog stand like it's not going to cost you seven dollars for a piece of spam musubi particularly for a piece of overwrought overdone unnecessarily fancified spam musubi there is my rant i'm done for the morning you, you, you better be like cutting that shit up. Like, you know how like back in the eighties they would cut apple slices and make swans out of them. Like you better be doing that with spam if you're gonna like charge that much for spam, I think, you know? And it's just, it's-, home, I've it's put Apple slices on my spam and on my spam musubi and it's great, but you have to do it right. Yeah. And it's a little like, it, it was kind of, upsetting to find out for me like to to find out that luncheon meat or, or spam was associated with poverty because like in Malaysia when I was growing up like it was expensive like canned meat is somehow like really expensive here or, or was and so like spam is like a special treat you you can you have we and the way we served it in my household was like we would cut it into slices and we would like deep fry that shit and that was like pretty like it's super delicious because it's crispy and you eat it with like rice porridge and ah. Uh, anyways, but that's like a special occasion thing. You only get to eat it if you're like sick. It's a special treat. That's how rare it was. Like it's a special treat and to make you feel better, like you eat it when you're sick. So when I thought when I moved to Canada, I'm just like really confused at how everyone's just like, why are you eating this this thing? You don't know what's gone into it. It's like you don't know what's gone into your chicken nuggets either. Or your hot you dogs. know what's been fed to your cows. I, I don't know. Really? Like, like you are already just... disassociated from your food. I can't take you to like the, the Thai restaurant and eat whole deep fried fish in front of you because y'all like freaking out at the fact that bones in the fish. Like, why are you freaking I out? I mean, there's a How reason. What's going spam? There's a reason how the sausage is made is a phrase. Yes. <laughs> I'm also being asked to repeat something in the chat. So just want to say like the hypocrisy of white Americans finding spam gross when like we've seen the meat jello disasters of the 70s and 80s and like, we've all been there we've seen that shit it's like y'all have no room to talk get not off your meat jello high horse that none at all I think a, a lot of it has to do with like the the way that food different foods are developed and how like they start out one way and then they move to another and and it goes into like all these complicated processes of like 
availability and what is, you know, because if I, I can't remember where I first ever heard of spam. I don't know if I've ever eaten it, but I didn't get the idea that spam was something that was supposed to be gross and disgusting until I was older, like in college, maybe. Um, and so what, and like now they're all yelling at me in the chat because I've never eaten spam. Um, but, but at some point, spam was considered something that was like, everybody should be eating it. And then somehow it migrated down to, oh, that's poor people food. But there are a lot of foods that are like that, where it starts off being like, oh, it's just mainstream. And then it becomes like, oh, that's what poor people eat. But it's like, well, but the reason why that's what poor people eat is because it has now become more available and thus it is less expensive to produce, thus less, does it cost less. And so more people can have it, but suddenly when more people can have it, it's bad. Um, I have <laughs> so many, so many thoughts about that. Um, but one thing I wanted to uh, ask you all is because because we've actually covered all the questions that were that were laid out for us. But um, I actually wanted to uh, get into how we how you all either use this or have seen this uh, the stuff that we're talking about used well in fiction because um, is as we started at the beginning, there's, um, Aliette has all these wonderful ways of incorporating food and tea into her fiction. And, and what I want to know is like, how, uh, do each of you approach, um, using different elements of food and food culture in your fiction, or where have you seen it done really well that like, it made you just really feel like the author understood it. Um, and anybody can jump in who wants to start. And immediately nobody jumps in. <laughs> wow. It's just like, I'm just immediately thinking about Naru Sundal's um, A Handful of Dao, which is like this space opera recipe story. And it starts off with, with like a recipe for dao that looks fairly familiar. It's like, this is, you know, how you make dao. And it's very clear that they're going off to space. And each, this this recipe as it goes off into space changes and it's clear that different generations have tried to recreate this this recipe and they're failing and at some point like the the recipe's just like some rice and some water because um and every recipe is accompanied like in a food blog like you know with this with this um a uh, paragraph or two that's just kind of like thinking through like, oh, we, this, is, this is what's happening now. Um, we're having another war. We're on a generation spaceship. We're on a different planet now. We have, you know, what is this thing that we were supposed to add to this other, to this, to this recipe? We don't know whether or not it's the same thing. Um, and the final recipe comes full circle and it's, the same recipe as before but that's also like this very point and like it's we know that this is probably not the same exact same flavor as what our, our ancestors ate and like when I get that I'm just like I'm just sitting here I want to cry because like you know this whole changes to food and like the way you you struggle to survive and try and struggle so hard to hold on to the remnants of the past, but needing to change along the way. And eventually, you know, broken clock strikes twice or whatever, like you somehow hit on the same recipe, but you know that it's probably not gonna be the same thing because you're in a different galaxy. Um, it's, it's very moving. Um, and it's the, the scale of which it, um, it thinks through how food changes, I think it's, is, um, is of interest to me right now. Um, the, the idea of like time on a larger scale and generational shifts um, over thousands of years, um, the, the, the idea of the, uh, the, the long now, right? Um, and, uh, and so I think about that a lot. Um, and I also think about like food preparation. I've really only written like one story, which is about like preparing food. And that's just cause I was just craving like bakute um, when I was at, Clar at the Clarion workshop. And I was just like, wow, I, 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 I'm, 
I'm in San Diego and like there's all these people and we're all hungry and we probably all like pork and I just want to I just want to have this very very specific spice blend um, soup dish. And I find happen to find it in the Chinese grocery store, and so I, I make it and I was like, what is the bakute spice mix? Because like it literally means meat bone tea, which says nothing about what's actually in it. Um, and I look it up and it's like this very arcane mix of things where I'm just like, I have never even heard or seen in with my own two eyes, half of these herbs, or maybe I have, and I just don't recognize it. I don't know, because like my dad just kind of like goes to the shop and he buys them the herbs and he just puts them in the soup and nothing more is said about them, right? So I kind of like spent like an entire week just researching like the different herb that goes into, into the spice mix and like what their names are. I don't even know how to pronounce them. And uh, half of the, half the time is like some, some scientific name, which they kind of like plaster on next to like the Chinese name on, on the packaging. I'm like, well, okay, I guess this is, this is good enough. We'll, we'll just go with this. Um, so I just used the Chinese name in my story. And it's just like, I just, I just want to think about like this very, cause it's a very peasant food. Like, like it's one of those, like you cook it early in the morning and like you just let it simmer all day long you eat it and once you run once the hawker stall runs out of the soup you run out of the soup right now you they just kind of like replenish and they just keep re replenishing the soup but back in the day like it was once once they run out of the pot they run out of the pot because it's it's very time consuming to pre re uh, prepare it again um and so i just wanted to like write a, a story about preparing a soup because that's just the act of preparation food preparation is um is of is the part that's of deepest interest to me more than the tasting and more than the eating itself i have to admit um quick question what is the name of the first story that you mentioned and who wrote it that is naru sandal's a handful of dal it was um, published in um, People of Color Destroy Science Fiction, which was edited by Nara Hopkinson. Um, and it has since been republished in Podcastle. Awesome. I think Michi wanted to jump in as well. Um, sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've talked about this story on Twitter, but honestly, one of my absolute favorites is Anya's uh, story that she had in Uncanny's uh, Dinosaur. Uh, issue, um, Everything Under Heaven, because it was just like, I mean, aside from the fact that the entire story is based around questing for you know, a dragon, which is actually a dinosaur, not because they're trying to like, you know, save a village or, you know, find treasure, any of these like what you would consider typical Western, um, you know, hunting for dragon stories, it's because you want to learn how to cook the, you know, cook the beast and how to actually, and how to make it part of your own repertoire. And it's the main character, it's all about the main character is like trying to you know, as, assert her own, um, her the, you know, own viewpoint on food and struggling with tradition and how important food is in the, the culture the main character comes from. And just, it's one of those things where it's like, this is, it's not about the food, it's about what the food symbolizes and what food tells you about your relationships with people, your relationships with the, you know, with your cultural background, who you want to be and how you talk to each other. Um, another example is John Chu's uh, Restore the Heart into Love, um, which is, a, it's, it's a science fiction setting and the way that John, I mean, like John's writing is fantastic in general, uh, but the fact that he writes about uh, the story is sort of about the change of language and whether or not those changes come with an agenda over, you know, erasing particular uh, Chinese characters that have different meanings in order to create one state, uh, you know, one state approved meaning of a particular word or phrase and looking at how language is a thing that is mixed and evolved and it requires a deep understanding, not just someone's imposed agenda. 
and it's sort of uh, juxtaposed against this person's uh, fraught relationship with his mother, where he's learned how to speak English, but his family still speaks uh, Chinese, they don't speak English. And the way that they talk to each other is through the food and through the bone broth that she makes for him to take into outer space on a mission where he doesn't know if he's ever going to come back. And the way that he talks about the, the building of the layers of flavor and the broth and the amount of effort. And it's clear that the food is him thinking about the food is him processing how his mom still feels about him and how there, because she's put so much effort into this thing, it is a different, it's saying something different to him than her verbal, uh, her verbal communications that he interprets as her being disappointed in him. It's a really beautifully complex story, but when food is used to underscore our relationships with each other and our understandings of who we, who we are and where we come from, those, that's what, uh, as an editor, those are one of the things that I look for in stories that feature food. I don't care about the spread of a banquet and the different types of food there are and you know how you know there are servants rushing to and fro with all these different platters laden of food. And yes, I'm you know looking at you, George R. R. Martin, and Game of Thrones. Um, but it is that's not that's that's the you know the the surface of what food is, the different types of food and how they taste and how people eat them and what they look like. You know, it's, again, Harry Potter is also a really good example of this. You know, they talk about the feasts that they have at the holiday time, but there's no discussion of what emotional connections people have to those foods. If you have kids at a magical school coming from all over the world or even just different parts of the UK, what kind of foods would they be looking for? How would they feel about seeing something so familiar to them in a place that is unfamiliar? Like all of those things, you, I really want to see that in fiction, I want to see food as a gateway into a deeper understanding of who we are and where we come from. Awesome. Anya, do you wanna talk either a little bit about your story or uh, other fiction that you have read that has uh, gone really deep into food that you've been? For a lot of my own fiction, the food that's featured is probably what I felt like eating at the time of writing it. So for Uncanny, that was Wakaluak, which is like a candle nut dark stew. It's a bit hard to explain, especially at 2 a.m. But yeah, food is very much personal to me because I'm partly Peranakan. So it's a matriarchal sort of food culture where you pass down from the women's side of the family. And that ties a lot into how and who is making the food in my stories. Like... Um, this year I published a couple, uh, Life in Acha is, well, I was hungry for Acha at the time, but it's very much about a woman looking for someone worthy to inherit her recipes from. And um, Seven Parts Full was pretty much about a sort of a food competition between a chef and a general. Now for stories I read recently that I like, I think my favorite book this year is um, the Pasha Cuisine by Sagan, er Sagan Erson. And it's um, about the magic of food during the Ottoman Empire. And the book will make you so hungry reading it. I think you probably shouldn't read it when, you're, you, when you haven't eaten. Yeah, no, I'm dropping in chat. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I think, I mean, I see food in fiction doing a number of different things like, you know, uh, Jamie and Michi and Anya have already talked about that a little bit. There's uh, food as world building, right? Where you get the dishes spread on the table and what kind of dishes are being eaten and what kind of comfort foods are being consumed reveals a lot about the culture first uh, and then about the characters and what it what it is that build them and how they're likely to behave right uh, in my own fiction i very often associate food with memories because that's very much where i come from in my perception of food um but there's not only the consumption of food there's um 
So dinners and banquets and meals are social events, right? Which um, New Year's, for instance, involves a lot of standing around in kitchens, uh, at least in Vietnam, involves a lot of standing around in kitchens, preparing food, preparing labor intensive food, right? Um, I know I'm not the only one who has memories of like, you know, being directed to do the dumplings because you have all the family together. Hey, what can we do? Dumplings. Uh, it's easier when you've got fifth, you know, 15 people underhand to prepare that kind of ginormous feast. And during that time is a time of catching up, is a time of chatting, is a time of having social interactions. Um, and you will also, also find that obviously in the feast itself and in the food itself, uh, the consumption of food um, and the socializing that happens around that, whether it's a buffet, whether it's a formal feast, whether it's a quick meal that is being cooked at midnight after you know the mum has come home from work and finds her husband or her children in the kitchen, uh, to take just one example. Um, the books I've read, which I felt did a good job around food. So one of them is not a science fiction book, but I'm gonna drop it in here all the same. Uh, it's uh, Luke, uh, uh, sorry, Luke uh, Nguyen's Indochine which is, uh, so Lu Nguyen is a, a Vietnamese Australian chef who goes back to Vietnam and then on to France and is trying to trace the family history through food. Um, so it's full of recipes, but it's also the most interesting bits that I found were not the recipes, it's the bits where in between where he details how he talks to people and how he traces the history of the dishes that he's presenting and the history of his own family. and in particular, the history of migration of his whole family across countries. Um, the other story I wanted to mention is Alisa Wong's Olivia's Table in A Thousand Beginnings and Endings, which is about a chef who goes to, a, um, I think it's in Arizona, I can't remember exactly where it is, but it's somewhere in the west of the US and it's a very tourist town. Um, and she makes a feast for hungry ghosts and it becomes about memories, it becomes about hunger, about needs, about grief. Um, and so the food gets transfigured into something else that I find is more interesting, again, than the simple description of the food. Um, in my own fiction, I try to put food everywhere because, you know, um, like Anya, I'm very much a fan of, hey, I want to eat this. I could put it on the page. That way I could eat it and write about it. Uh, and it's very much for me a way to make people bond uh, a way for people to remember what they have eaten. So a big thread in the stories that I'm writing is I have spaceships who are um, basically interact with other people via their avatars. So technically they don't actually need the food, but socially they consume the food because it's how they interact with people and it's how they connect with their own memories. So there is an entire industry of virtual ship food, which is being served to them alongside memories. Uh, and it's something I put a lot of thought into because I was like, they don't need food. But I mean, we don't need all the elaborate ritual around food either, right? So to some extent, food serves other purposes than just making sure we're upright. Oh, thank you. Uh, last one goes to Nibs. Oh gosh, uh, where do I even start with food and fiction? I actually, I actually just, um, taught a four hour long workshop last month for Clarion West on food and fiction. Uh, this was like, yeah, world building, um, what a culture eats, what it prioritizes, what's considered a delicacy, what's considered disgusting, uh, says so much about a culture, right? Because uh, those decisions are made in a vacuum. There, there are cultural narratives, dominant cultural narratives that play uh, dictating what gets to be a delicacy, what's get, what, what is considered disgusting. Uh, what's a luxury, what's a staple, how does your culture view mealtimes, how does it view scarcity, how does it view preservation versus excess uh, uh, food. And there's a, I, I could teach a whole workshop or just like just on food and horror because like there's just so much to be said about food and desire and food and hunger and like the, the pun intended during the tables, oppressed oppress during the tables of their oppressors, which is actually a, a theme in uh, my fiction, especially the story that's been nominated for a Nebula and a Hugo and an Ignite this year. Uh, it's called um, 10 Excerpts from an Annotated Bibliography on the Cannibal Woman of Ratnabar Island. I know it's a mouthful, um, but 
one of the themes in there is about like the oppressed turning the tables once again, pun intended, on their oppressors and hunger and monstrousness and embracing your appetites and desires and like uh, refusing to let the world deem your appetites deviate or monstrous or too much. I'm so distracted by Michi's cat in the background being cute right now. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, this like this this became a cat call while uh, you guys can't see it. Like all of a sudden, cats everywhere, and it's awesome. I mean, this is my favorite part of like every Zoom is like the 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 phase where we all bring our cats out. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna recommend this anthology called Sharper Sugar Tooth. Uh, I think it's published by Upper Rubber Rubber Boot Press, and it was edited by Octavia Cade. And it's an anthology about women and speculative fiction and food and I yes horror like not all the stories are scary but they are are all dark fantasy or heritage and it's just absolutely amazing it just it covers every the entire spectrum of how we interact with food and what it means to us and once again it's called sharp and sugar tooth i can't recommend it enough awesome all right so it's it's 15 after the hour and it looks like it is time for some of us to turn into pumpkins and others of us to finally get our morning coffee so uh i want to thank all of the panelists and i want to give you each a chance uh to just say like where people can find you uh if they want to talk to you more about food or if they want to follow you and read all of your works uh and so we can go back in the order before um aliat you start uh, I'm on Twitter as AliadDB, and I have a website, AliadDibodar.com, which has a newsletter, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention my Patreon, because it has recipes, which is on Patreon and easily found. Recipe Patreon, I love it. Jamie? Um, I'm on uh, JamieGo.com, which is my static um, page with my bibliography. I'm on Twitter as Jamea, J-H-A-M-E-I-A. I'm also on the Instagrams where I will post pictures of foods that I've been eating because I live in like this, like this very commercial area with a lot of restaurants that are constantly like changing. So part of my visit home, like my strangely extended visit home, even with the lockdown has been to like sample the various different foods here. Um, and like strangely like Korean de Korean fried chicken is suddenly a thing here now and I've eaten from like four different Korean fried chicken places since getting home um and that I am Jamea Go on Instagram I am also on Tumblr not as much as before I'm also on Facebook Jamie Go writes that's my Facebook page um and yeah that's that's where you can find me I am also on Curious Fictions if anybody wants to subscribe to me there. Awesome. Nips? Yes, uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, my handle is actually in my Zoom name. I don't know if you can see it, but it is at H-E-R underscore Nibsen, her Nibsen. Um, I also have a Patreon, which is linked on my Twitter. Uh, and I also post recipes there for uh, Bengali, home-cooked Bengali food. It's been a, a relatively recent introduction to my Patreon, but I do have uh, recipes for ben my mom's Bengali chicken curry and khichri up there so far. So check that out. Awesome. Thank you. Michi? Uh, so you can find me on Twitter at Geek Melange. Um, I don't have a Patreon yet. It's definitely something I've been thinking about doing because I would look, you know, I post about food enough as it is and I should probably start posting some of the recipes of things that I make because um, I will say if you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, uh, my handles on both are the same. I post a lot about food, a lot. Um, and people yell at me for making them hungry. So sorry. Uh, you'll also probably find lots of pictures of my cat. Um, <laughs> who has uh, apparently decided to steal the show in the last five minutes of this whole thing. Uh, you can also find me through SIFWA uh, at, as editor-in-chief, uh, and some of my essays are up on Uncanny all over the place. I'm trying to get back into more writing because editing has just taken up so much time in my brain, but hopefully, hopefully more writing. Awesome. Yes, more writing. And Anya? Um, I'm... Anya SY on Twitter and Instagram. So, and Anya SY.com for my website. On Instagram, usually you'll be following 
like photographs of what I'm eating in Melbourne. But since the lockdown, we're still locked down here in stage four. So it's just pictures of my cats right now. Pictures of cats are 100% acceptable. Uh, so again, I want to thank you all for this really wonderful conversation. Um, now I'm hungry. We were all like talking, we're like, we're getting takeout in the, after this is all over because who oh, the foods? Um, and apparently I got to go out and find some spam. Uh, but you do get a black pepper <laughs> spam. Black pepper spam is really interesting. <laughs> oh, I, I will. I will have the spam. I will do it. Okay. Um, so good. Yes. So, uh, Again, this is a presentation of the Carl Brennan Society. Um, I hope you have all enjoyed watching and, and becoming hungry with all of us. If you would like to support more of these awesome panels, uh, you can go to carlbrennan.org. Uh, you can donate directly or you can just follow us on Twitter at Carl Brennan. We also have uh, a Facebook page somewhere, the Carl Brennan Society, and we will let you know when other panels are coming up. Um, and if you are watching this, not live, but uh, later on after we post this. Uh, everybody's information is in the description or in the blog post where you find this. Um, please follow all of these people. They are all amazing writers and editors and people who post food and make others hungry. And they're just all people that you want to get to know. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to all the people who uh, donated uh, so they could come and be with us live today. And we will see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.